Black, Black Rage, Rage back, back for, for the, the 90s, 90s. And, and we, we got, got a, surprise a surprise for you. For you. Damn, another, 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 another step, step up with disrespect. I'll check, check over with lyrics to leave a life in a total wreck. I'll put her in a room and make them show the dough was locked. Lyrics flow into her ears, microphone piping hot. Left in a trans dance, no. I think a better sister never heard a female come off. It's hard as this, lift me as a lunatic. Beware the one of a few, to hear real rhymes and might put your brain in two. Don't you understand that the power of a woman strong? Blast in my brain, see your brain damage is lifelong. We're talking about race, cause to live lower society as long as I flow in the walk to war with variety. Some truth to ask wise me. No other female will get as far as me. Maybe when I'm old and gray, someone will surprise me. But that's not like me. I'm born with a female who can fade me. No one holds a man of capacity to grade me. And bro, I might think I'm stepping your reverse the thought. I'll leave the thing of damn with that marvel in your brain is lost. But don't feel bad, you're just one of many. To fall victim to the lyrics, got it better than the enemy of friends. The end has come to write the epitaph. Loud now, but who you're Dying in the lyrical blood bath. Some stare in amazement at the rocks of us. They never heard a female get critical, like marvelous. Before there was rap, there was dance. In the late 1970s, while hip hop was being created at block parties in Brooklyn, Sacramento had break dancers. This was a time that created funky fresh clothing, pop locking, electric keyboards, boom boxes, heavy drum tracks, and other roots of the hip hop culture. This era eventually gave birth to the Breaking Movie series, Crush Groove, and many more. This is uh, Ice T shooting a little drama out to the man first degree. You know, we were fortunate enough to be on the uh, album with Brother Lin Chunk. When I first came out, there wasn't really nobody really rapping out of California, but I remember Too Short was already up and running. Now, there was a few people here and there, but you know, when I decided to, to really get seriously out of the game and into hip hop, there was really nobody that was really making noise nationally. During this time, East Coast rap pioneers were creating a genre, defining a culture. Their messages were about fun, respect, and what was going on in the hood. Uh, being somebody who was one of the first artists on the West Coast, I just wanted the West Coast to win. I didn't care whether you was from South Central or the South Bay, or, or I didn't care where you were from, you know, Vallejo. I didn't care as long as we was California and we was the West Coast. And SAC was always a very powerful part of the West Coast. To be the king of Sacramento in those days, you had to not only know how to pop, but survive and control a dance battle. Okay. The main DJ in town was DJ Daryl Dennis. He was known for pumping up local events. DJ Daryl was the local star. That was until the Triple Threat 3, which was Raymond DC Ray Haskins, Michael Mike C. Carraway, and Bruce Captain K. Knight hit the scene. They was rapping. For the record, DC Ray was the first Sacramento rapper, and the Triple Threat Three was the first Sacramento rap group. 
Tell us about forming the Triple Threat Three and their musical flow. Man, when we, before the three, we were actually two. We needed another voice. I felt we needed another voice to, to be more dynamic as a group. We had a battle that was going on at uh, Fantasia Skating Ring. I don't know if you remember Fantasia Skating Ring over in uh, Southside. And so we would uh, go over there and we had some, like nine groups on the list that night. And we were watching the other groups so that I could get one. And so we seen this group that had Mike C in it and Cloud Nine. And Mike C was spitting and spitting and spitting. I was like, that's the guy, mm -hmm. right? So we got at him after that after that battle. And that's how we became the Triple Threat Three. We listened to him. I invited him back to our spot where we, you know, could listen to him without, you know, anything around him. And, you know, the dude had good precision. He had nice speed. Cali sack, we, we always try to be different. That's why we, we're flippers here, man. We flip. That's how I wanted me to be. So that's how, I, how we pursued it. And so when I put the group together, uh, that's what I was looking for, somebody with precision and good speed. So yeah, Mike C fit the bill and the Triple Threat 3 was born. And how old were you guys? Six, I was 16, they were 15. DC Ray and the Triple Threat 3 started around this time. South Sacramento, already known for its dance battles, also became known for intense rap battles as well. Tell us about forming the Triple Threat 3. In, a, in a, a long story short, back in our heyday, rap battle of the DJs and battle rap and all that was a way of life. I was running with various rap groups and it was a group called the Double Deuce, which was DC Ray and Bruce. The last group that I was with leading up to me getting with them was called the Terrible Two. We uh, had a rap battle at Florence Skating Ring, uh, Fantasia. And uh, it was by process of elimination, and then it came all the way down to us and the double deuce. And uh, my partner froze up on stage. Uh, <laughs> and that night, uh, I left that click and vowed that I was going to get with Ray and Bruce and uh, form a group. I approached them about it. Bruce really wasn't with it. Ray was saying he was thinking about adding a member, but it was going to be a female. And, you know, uh, one thing led to another. We got to be friends. And then from there, we just, uh, you know, we kicked it so long, man, we just grew, grew together. You know what I mean? And we formed a triple threat. And, you know, the rest is, you know, what it is. Burbank was the main spot. MCs from all over started coming down reflects D.C. Ray on Fahrenheit Radio's Fahrenheit Hour Urban Talk Show. Eventually, Sacramento's unique hip-hop style was on display in alleys, house parties, DJ parties, high schools, and dance clubs in the form of freestyle rap. It was pure urban expression. It was the stuff that created what Sacramento is now known for. Hard-edged, in-your-face reality music. When the dust settled, DC Ray and the Triple Threat Three became our Sac Town representatives. They were 16. Man, Triple Threat Three, man, that's the OGs, homie. Big DC Ray, Big Mike C, man, all the OGs, homie, you know what I'm saying? They inspired a lot of entertainers from the 80s to do music. You know, they had the first rap record out of Sacramento, which inspired me to keep going, you know what I mean, to do what I do. You know what I'm saying? So shout out to Mike Carraway and uh, DC Ray, man, Triple Threat Three. Man, y'all don't know what it is, man. First degree, man, this is some real shit, man. Them niggas put that shit out there, homie, and made everybody want to be a rapper, homie. Straight up. Can you tell us about the Burbank rap battles? Burbank rap battles were always hard because, you know, everybody, you know, wanted to be tight. You know, we had already transitioned from the dance phase into rapping, and we had started to make a name for ourselves. So as we were making a name for ourselves, all of a sudden we started here seeing other guys coming out of the kind of the woodwork. I went to the bank, so, you know, it, it was like being on my home turf. So, yeah, you know, we came and, uh, you know, we did our things and before you knew it, man, we, the Triple Threat Three started really, you know, guys started knowing who we were when we show up at other high school battles. Leading up to getting with the Threat, DC Ray and Bruce, they were pretty much winning all the battles and uh, I was in some pretty good cliques, pretty good groups. I was putting together some pretty good material Somebody who you, you all might know by the name of Jay King. He had a group called Frost. We uh, was issued a challenge 
well, not just us, but Sacramento period, they were saying that they was the best in SAC and blah, 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 and to the triple threat, that was a, that was a direct <laughs> insult. You couldn't speak like that around the Kings. And uh, we stalked them, man, we dog walked them, and every Sunday at uh, William Land Park, you know, battles were coming. You know, and even when we formed a triple threat, you know, we had a battle in L.A. We walking down the street, see some cats in the parking lot. They out there spitting and battling. We got in the middle of it and slaughtered everybody. During D.C. Ray's 2015 appearance on Fahrenheit Radio's Fahrenheit Hour, First Degree the D mentioned a Rakim show and a show they are writing for for Fahrenheit Insight. I was before Rakim, includes DC Ray. Wow. Earlier this month, or last month, we talked about what was important in music. And you had mentioned that being positive was important. Being positive gets you into a lot of venues that people who are scared of your music won't allow you to. If you want to get your message across, sometimes you, you can still do your hard stuff, but you have to balance it so that people can get to see who you are as an artist. You know, they'll, they'll close you out if, if, you, if, you're, if they're scared of you. You know, having some positive songs and stuff that makes you feel good, that makes your grandma get up because she ain't scared that her grandchildren can hear listen to your record. You know, yeah. that's what it was about then for us. And, and you know, yeah, I wanted to be, uh, you know, able to get into any venue. The positive songs, and it's funny, people remember the positive songs more. They sing the positive songs, you know, as far as, as, far as um, you know, having a message that they can relate to. I've been to shows down in LA when I had shows down there where uh, people would come up to me after a performance and give me stuff because they liked the show that much. They liked the message in the show that much. I had a, a brother from the army give me a Nefertiti, gold Nefertiti necklace, very nice. Had a lot of women give me beads, necklaces, men too. It wasn't just women and it would trip me out because it would let me see the power of the message, the power of the, the, the positive message in the music. So yeah, I enjoyed moments like that in my, in my career. Back then, you had to sell your music out the trunk like too short, remembers DC Ray. Before digital downloads and streamings, before the presence of independent distributors, before it became easy to get your music to the public, they were selling music out the trunk. Selling music out the trunk is a term used by independent artists, meaning selling music directly to the consumer, face to face, on the street, at shows, or at other events. In time, face to face music sales will be one of Northern California rappers' most essential traits. Independent record store insiders like Russ Solomon of Tower Records, Dylan Radakovitz of Dimple Records, and Saeed Balance Crumpler of Rasputin Music in Dubai made it possible for independent artists to take their music from the trunk to the stores. In 2007, world-renowned London-based writer Brian Bartholomew traveled to the United States to do research for his rap documentary, Feel Me Before They Kill Me. For his project, he traveled the entire U.S., meeting MCs from different regions along the way. It was amazing how Brian was able to come from a foreign land and chop it up with so many rap stars. At the end of his trip, Brian interviewed Northern California artists and noted that the independent spirit is out its peak here in Northern California one of Sacramento and the Bay Area's greatest gifts to America's music industry was demonstrating the will to bypass the major labels and go independent. The more common practice was to sit around and beg major labels to sign you. Major companies, big companies are very, very simple. You know, bottom line is, if we get nine, we ain't got nothing to do with you. You know what I mean? Yeah. We ain't getting the lion's share. We ain't winning. We don't want nothing to do with you. You know, so mm. I just call them very simple. I don't, I don't think they have a play mentality. I just think they have the mentality of you work for me and we're the corporation. Now, what's fucked up when you're dealing with entertainment? That's something that a person gives themselves. Nowadays, 
Selling music independently is common. Brian Bartholomew died before finishing the documentary. Once DC Ray became king of urban sack, the buzz exploded past our Sacramento borders and reached Dubai area, and eventually Los Angeles and New York. We performed with Houdini. We performed with Run DMC. We performed with Dr. Dre and the World Class Wrecking Crew, Bobby Jimmy and the Critters, Ooh, uh, L.A. Dream Team. Preparation was pretty much, man, we had a manager. His name was Razorblade. He had live equipment in his, in his garage. The whole garage was uh, like a studio. We had a DJ named Spoonie G, which as far as I'm concerned is the rawest cat to ever touch the turntable. We just never, just like all of us, we never got to that pinnacle where we wanted to be to get that recognition. We would be in the garage. I can recall it being so cold that you could see your breath. And this cat would be blowing on his hands and scratching on the turntables. So preparing, like I said, preparing, man, we was always prepared. We didn't have to prepare. We stayed polished, we stayed rehearsed. Nobody had to put it in us. Nobody had to drill us. Nobody had to make us do it. We were brothers, we was comrades. We all were rap fanatics. We loved music. We loved hip hop. We loved what we did. And we stayed prepared because this was what we did. At that time, we knew we had some guys coming through that you know were known from New York. And you know we wanted to set it off and let them know that when they came to SAC, we had, we had heat out here too. And we would rehearse a lot. Rehearsing a lot is important. Whenever you rap enough with a guy, you know where his pauses and breaks are. As a group, when you know that, you're tighter. You're more of a tight unit. And that was one thing that we were really trying to do. I was trying to get for a triple threat three, no matter whether there's another group that was, because there was a treacherous three out there in New York. You know, there was, a, we were hoping as many New York rappers came here as possible, because we wanted to, that's how we wanted them to go back talking about the, the dudes that was out west. Yeah. You know, we knew it went great when Russ and them approached us about, you know, you know, the idea of joining on with them. You know, and even not only that, the groups, you know, Ron and them and, you know, a couple of the other entourage were like, yeah, you guys were tight, man. And then, of course, all of our people, I don't think they expected, they didn't know what to expect. So when they, when we came off like we came off, they were happy too. That's all, it's all good to know that we achieved what we wanted to do. But the ultimate flattery was when he invited us to come join him. We actually had a show with Houdini one time where they got too in intoxicated to perform. We had already performed to open up for Houdini. And so the owner was frantic and people was, you know, frantic because you got these big cats that's not able to, to you know, to come on and do their set. Eventually they walked off. And hey, the threat did what the threat had to do, man. We came back, knocked out a whole nother set, did a whole nother thing and saved the club that night. Our style was seamless and flawless. It was at this time that Russell Simmons, Def Jam Records, and new rap group Run DMC were blowing up the East Coast. Let's get one thing clear. Rap as we know it originated in New York City. In the 1970s, pioneers like DJ Hollywood, DJ Cool Herc, DJ Red Alert, Grandmaster Flash, Africa Bambada and the Soul Sonic Force, The Furious Fight, and others changed the world with their rhythmic rhyming, urban swag, and break beats. Without the block parties and hip hop evolution in boroughs of New York, there would be no Sacramento rap. Inspired by the success of one of the first rap songs, Rapper's Delight by the Sugar Hill Gang, Queens native and college student Russell Simmons teamed up with MC Eddie Chiba and Curtis Walker, AKA Curtis Blow, to make a move. Hey, 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 everybody. I'm Curtis Blow for Sacramento Rap History. Wow, well, so we're talking about the 70s from, I'd say, about 1977 till about, you know, 1980. Uh, that's the times I was hanging out with Russell, going to college. Um, and uh, we were party animals, crazy, crazy, wild, crazy party animals. In 1979, Simmons and Curtis Blow recorded an independently released Christmas rapping. It was a hit. Wow. 
we got involved in this thing called hip hop at an early, early, early stage. We became promoters, uh, giving parties uh, all around in the college. We became this production company called uh, Rush Productions, the force in college disco. And uh, man, I, I remember Russell's dad used to say, you know, we used to eat, sleep, and drink disco. We used to go to clubs Tuesday nights, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, four or five different clubs, promoting our clubs and um, promoting early, early hip hop DJs like, you know, DJ Hollywood, Eddie Chiba, Lovebug, Starsky, Grandmaster Flash, and, uh, um, you know, the Funky Four Plus One More. Uh, we were promoting those early, early uh, groups before we made records. And then we started making records. He became my manager in 1980. And uh, the rest is history. Yeah, so we go back. It was wild and crazy days. I say it was more like, you remember that movie, Delta House? Uh, um, yeah, we were, we were like that sci-fi uh, fraternity and create just wild and crazy, crazy party animals. Uh, and I, I, I thank God that we were blessed and fortunate enough to survive. Amen. Amen. The hip hop being created at the time was urban, revolutionary expression that was just waiting to burst out from the scenes. Simmons' next step was to partner up with Rick Rubin and form Def Jam Records. Def Jam was off and running with their new release, 16-year-old LL Cool J's I Need a Beat. By 1982, Simmons' younger brother, Joseph Simmons, formed a hip-hop group with Daryl DMC McDaniels and Jason Jam Master J. Mitzel. In 1984, Run DMC released Run DMC, and the album went on to become the first rap album to be certified gold. 500,000 units sold. Run DMC decided to take their block party on the road. That road led to Sacramento, and in 1983, DC Ray and the Triple Threat 3, Houdini, and Run DMC did a show at the second level in Sacramento. It was Sacramento's first big rap yeah. show. A 13-year-old Kevin Brother Lynch hung man was front row. Other local up-and-coming MCs was in the building as well. The Triple Threat 3 turned the party yeah. out, getting the attention of Russell Simmons. After the show, Russell Simmons told the Triple Threat 3 crew about their new label, Def Jam Records. Although the Triple Threat 3 had heard of Run DMC and LL Cool J, Def Jam Records itself was a mystery to the crew. Everything was so fresh. Everything was so new. Simmons pitched to the three was that Def Jam was what becoming else? the biggest label in New York. Later that night, Russell Simmons offered the Triple Threat 3 a contract. This was it. Signing with a nationally renowned record label was NEMC's dream. However, there was a catch. They had to move to New York and they had to decide that. Marty Hahn was the person that promoted that uh, the Run DMC concert where the Triple Threat 3 opened. And uh. it was at Galactica 2000 at that point. So Marty Hahn was saying, hey, these guys are good. Why don't you sign them? Like Russ, why don't you sign these guys? And he kept saying, I don't know how I'm going to do that because I'm in the East. They're in the West. Yeah. That's kind of difficult to, to maintain. And I remember um, Russell kept talking about Mike C's voice, kept saying that he reminds him of somebody, 
I forgot who it was. I think the rapper Jimmy Spicer or somebody else back on the East Coast. He kept saying, like, she sounds like him. Well, Marty Hahn kept saying, well, go ahead and sign him. Like, sign these dudes. <laughs> when reflecting on history, there are a few moments that shape the future as we know it. In this book, there are about five moments that carve the course of Sacramento rap history. Russell Simmons offering the Triple Threat 3 this record deal was one of them. The Triple Threat 3 discussed the offer within themselves. So, I, you know, even I didn't know at that time that Skip Davis was in the room, Marty Hahn was in the room, Russell Simmons was in the room, and Run DMC was in the room, and Triple Threat 3 was in the room. Um. And we had no idea at that time that we were in the room with, you know, May Mayweather's publicist, Mariah Carey's stage manager, and one of the greatest hip hop impresarios on this planet. Mm. So. <laughs> I was still on my mission to make different types of music. And, you know, I, I just believe that, you know, it, it, the more well-rounded you can be musically, I think the more ground you can cover. Two of the Triple Threat Three members, DC Ray and Captain K, were in. One, Mike C, was out. Citing the mystery of Def Jam Records, their age, 16, and the distance. Well, we had a show out here with Ron DMC, and uh, we met Russell Simmons, Ron DMC, Jam Master J. You know, we met all the, the cats. We actually rode around in Sacramento with Ron and DMC in the car, and that's a whole other story. <laughs> uh, but we had just signed a contract with Saturn Records. Russ approached us about signing us, and uh, he was saying, don't worry about that contract and whatnot, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, if you want to come and mess with me, you know what I mean? That contract, don't worry about it. I'm 16 years old, but I'm the only one that got kids. I was married at the time, had my own place. So I had a, a set of responsibilities as well. And at the time when Russ offered to sign us, he wasn't the Russ that he is today. So I was way square on, and on some other type of stuff. And I had never been more than a 30 mile radius away from my mom. You know what I mean? And when he offered to sign us, he didn't offer to give us a whole bunch of money or a round trip ticket. It was on some, just come out here <laughs> and trust me, I got you. You know, That's tough right because there. he was saying that it costs too much money for us to travel from Sacramento to New York. Every time we have to do, you know, any, any type of appearance or anything, he would have to pay for us to fly back and forth and it was just too much money involved. And more or less, it was on some, hey, I got you, trust me. At the time, Def Jam was still an up and coming label from a coast far away. Since the members of the Triple Threat 3 were a group, they stuck together and declined Def Jam's offer. At that time, we thought about that and we went back and talked about it. We told them, hey, give us a day or two and let us think, of, think on it. And so that's what we did. We found a thought on it and me and BK didn't mind it, you know, we thought it might be a chance to, to go bigger. Um, Mike C didn't, you know, he, he was really not on board with it. And I, I felt like, you know, if you're gonna do things, you do things as a group. You know, yeah, we, we outnumbered it as far as two to one, but we felt that for all of us to be happy, and I, and, and I wanted for all of us to be happy with the decision. I don't want us to look back later, you know, oh, we abandoned SAC, oh, we abandoned, you know. So I, I, I really wanted to, to make sure we were all on the same page. And when Mike said no, you know, hey, we still love SAC. The whole mission was to rep SAC. So it didn't bother me too much, you know. And like I said, back then, they weren't that big yet. On the Fahrenheit Hour, First Degree and DC Ray reflect on how the Sacramento rap game could have been much more had they gone to New York. I can honestly say, you know, I love my brothers to death because we stuck together. If one said something, we all said it. And I regret that today to the fullest because I wonder what life might have been if we had took that journey. But by the same token, you know, I believe that God has everything in design. And maybe if I took that route, I might be dead right now. I could be a bigger icon or somebody that was famous and known all around the world and I might not. Right now, you know what I mean? Man. But I wish I hadn't robbed my brothers of that opportunity.
because now looking back, it wasn't just me. I could have took that chance too, but I'm a lot smarter, a lot older, a lot different. So, you know, but I'm the reason that that didn't happen because I just didn't want to leave that far away from home on a, on a promise. And sometimes they would get on the mic and start kind of emceeing the crowd because back then it was kind of like having a bonus to, you know, having an MC. Yeah. And the, they, were, they were phenomenal. I mean, DC Ray was 15, 16 years old, had a voice of a 40 year old man. Wow. And he just had a voice and a style. And. Captain Gay and Mike C was the same way. I mean, they just had deep voices for their ages, and Mike C would write, write constantly. In time, DC Ray and the Triple Threat 3's battle-proven style, grit, and lyrical emphasis had made its way to world-known executive producer Cletus Anderson in Los Angeles. In the 1980s, Cletus Anderson had purchased Saturn Records and was looking for a new sound to hit the market with. Cletus had made his fame with his VIP record stores in Long Beach, California. I, I wanted to make a demo tape. Um, not for me, but these guys were good. Let's send it out to different record companies. Um, never got, after about a month, I wasn't getting anything back. I just wasn't. I just didn't think it was in the cards to, for the Triple Threat 3 to get signed. Um, and I was sending out demo, like cassettes after demo cassettes. And um, I had about a five song, five song demo I put together. And uh, because of my age, it was probably the most unprofessional <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that probably had something to do with it. But, um, and then we get, I get a phone call back from Saturn Records, uh, Cletus Anderson. In 1983, Saturn Records signed the Triple Threat 3 and went to work on their first single, Scratch Motion. Oh, at the end of the year, I had a it's super stand out of the MC bunch Well, you want a translation to start the presentation That we are gonna do for you A DC Just let go of your emotions, let us take control That's what we came here tonight to do yeah. Cause when the chips are down, we never have to sweat Cause two-thirds of the majority will be the threat There ain't nothing to it, I'm sure that we can do it Our last and all the odds just to be here to prove it So, the countdown begun And listen to the captain who's threat number one I never feel the captain's here We'll chip a threat, break it out in the clear Let's step forward as you will truly see The fear break out of the to record the album, Cletus put the Triple Threat 3 in a hotel on the Hollywood Strip. While recording Scratch Motion, the Triple Threat 3 crew was looking to expand their sound. With this in mind, Cletus Anderson reached out to a local Compton group called the World Class Wrecking Crew. The World Class Wrecking Crew wasn't a rap group. They're more of a street poppin' dance group. In fact, the acting manager of the World Class Wrecking Crew, Alonzo Williams, famously hated rap. Their claim to fame was rocking big parties in the LA area, changing the game. Oh man, that was a, you know, a very nice first time out, you know, for us. I mean, Cletus, he put us up in a hotel out there in Hollywood. And uh, we went walking all around there, L.A. L.A. was a weird little town to us at the time. You know, as far as where we were, we weren't like in, probably in cool L.A. We were down in like tourist L.A. So yeah, we got a chance to do go on the Walk of Fame and we had never seen that stuff. So, you know, you always see it on TV. So we was kind of just, the damn nigga, we in L.A. <laughs> Our rapping got us here, dude. Can you believe That's that? Right. So we enjoyed it and he gave us, uh, I think, a day, it was a day or so to uh, just kind of like chill, relax, and get ready for the studio. Uh, having fun, doing what 16, 15 year olds do. To actually, we tore up that room. So we went to his house, we did get the chance to go to Cleese's house, eat dinner with him and his family, and they had a pretty nice house, long table, and we all sat there and, and chopped it up, and uh, yeah, he uh, kind of told us what we could expect the next day in the studio. 
for us it's 16, 15, you know, we were just waiting, waiting to rap, dude. Throw the mic in our face, we're ready, we want to rap, we want to rap, that's why we're here. So, you know, we practiced in the hotel as much as we could, just like we always do before, you know, doing any type of performance. And then we, the next day we head to the studio, man, and Bloodstone wasn't in there at the time, but, uh, you know, we had Spoonie G with us. And then uh, Dre was a friend of his, well, kind of, he knew Dre, acquaintance of his, and so he said that he had two DJs. We brought him, one was our own, which was uh, Spoonie. Spoonie was from New York, and he had came down here and uh, was living here for a while, and, and Spoonie was an excellent DJ, as you guys will hear if you listen to Scratch Motion. So uh, he was unknown, though. He was underground, and we liked that. We liked that he was underground, because no one really knew what to expect whenever we, whenever we had Spoonie on the cut. So, you know, but Spoonie was excellent at scratching, and uh, it's good that this story comes, because I, I'm glad to mention his name, so he's preserved for Erica Spoonie. You did your thing. Although the leader of the world-class wrecking crew hated rap, their young DJ loved it. He was an up-and-coming factor named Andre Young. Behind Alonzo's back, Andre was experimenting with the sounds of hip-hop and secretly planning his own takeover. Andre Young would eventually name himself Dr. Dre's. In 1984, Dr. Drake teamed up with the Triple Threat 3 on Scratch Motion. Dr. Dre was on a scratch. Yes, THE Dr. Dre scratches on Sacramento's first rap record, Scratch Motion. There were records, and they were in stores. Sacramento had representatives in the game much earlier than many are aware of. You know, when you hear the, 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 the pace of the beat, that's what gets you into your, oh, okay. You know, so, but the, the lyrics are always gonna be the meat, you know, and so the meat is where I wanted to make sure I was giving people enough of that so they would get full, man. They wouldn't be like, you know, when, when I wanted other rappers to hear and be like, can I write something tighter than that? You know, can I, can I be as technical as that? You know, I like technicality. You know, I like a dude making me think, challenging me, you know, with his lyrics. So, you know, that's, that's, and then on top of that, the message is, it has, has a piece of that pie too. Because overall, I want to leave the song feeling like, okay, I know what that dude was talking about. It made sense. I, I always want the rap legacy in Sacramento to be guys pushing the envelope, guys making their lyrics about something and giving us a nice meat with the meal, you know. I mean, you're bad. a lot of us got tight beats and ain't saying shit. So, you know, you, 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 you gotta have tight beats and be saying something. That's what's gonna make you, you know, in the lyrics is, if there was a lyrics hall, a lyrics is hall of fame, you know, I wanna be sitting there with all the great lyrics of all time, dude, you know, be able to hold my own. Can you talk to us about this, the, just the quality of music and the togetherness? With us, we knew each other. We understood each other. There was no egos. Everybody had a role to play, everybody played their role. Bruce was threat number one, I was threat number two, Ray is threat number three. We know who's gonna speak first, we know who's gonna speak second, we know who's gonna speak third, and we know when we're gonna all speak together. Ray was the leader of the camp, he was the, the boss of the crew. As far as I'm concerned, he was our leader. He wrote most of the hooks, um, he laid out a lot of the you know, melodies and foundations. Everybody wrote their own individual parts, but a lot of the hooks and things that we were doing was, I would say, I leaned more towards Ray. I don't know what Bruce's process was, so I can't speak for that man, but me, myself, I leaned more towards Ray and Bruce. And one of the things that made us so vicious, we rehearsed in the wash room in G Parkway in the alley. That was our little studio, sitting on the washing machine with a cassette player. And we smoke a little blunt, a little joint, but we were seamless. Like I said, there were no egos. But what I loved about us is, well, we got together three days a week, regardless, dedicated to rehearsing at, at uh, Razor Blaze, and then we would rehearse at Ray's house in the back, in the, um, in the laundry room. On Friday, when we leave on Friday, when we came back together on Monday, Ray would have something written that me and Bruce would have to write to. Bruce would have something written that me and Ray would have to write to, and I would have something written that Bruce and Ray would have to write to. And by the time we came back together again the next Monday, we had all that knocked out and we had some more for each other. So we pushed each other, we drove each other, we loved each other, bro, and we loved what we did. So it was, I don't know, it was just effort. I loved my brothers, I loved what we did, and 
I love the life that we lived and how we got it. I would come up with most of the choreography and routines and this and that because I was a popper, you know, that was my thing, you know what I mean? And, mm. you know, everybody had their role, you so know. you still pop? Yes, I can still hit. <laughs> yes, I can still move, sir. Scratch Motion had that old school break beat, rhythmic chant, rap style. The vocals consisted of MCs working together, rapping back and forth. It was a mix of Curtis Blow and Houdini, yet had a fresh feel. It was fast paced and electric, part of a golden era. In the mid 80s, the Triple Threat 3 had a real song out in stores, and the town couldn't believe it. It was one of those events that would change a city. On a Fahrenheit Hour episode with DC Ray, First Degree offers, if you ever get Brother Lynch real comfortable, he'll tell you how that Triple Threat 3 and Run DMC show got him in the game for reals. <laughs> he was in the front row. He fell in love with the rap game. DC Ray added, I remember when he was Kevin Ice Cold, what he was going by at the time. Sibo was just coming up. He's always been repping that name. DC Ray goes on to include, I like Brother Lynch, cause he always gives props about where it all came from. It's good there's people like yourself, D.E., to document our history. Thank you. After rocking Scratch Motion for a couple of years in clubs, in town and on the road, the Triple Threat 3 crew needed another single. They hit the studio and created a tribute to Marvin Gaye called We Love You, Martin. It was 1985, and the Triple Threat 3 was traveling the coast, turning out shows. The biggest show was a sold out, 20,000 people blowout event at Cal Expo in SAC. It was called The Spring Jam. DC Ray opened up for CC in the Music Factory and Marky Mark in the Funky Bunch. At this time, other Sacramento MCs like Oak Park's Homicide, The Godfather, Bad Mouth MC, and Young Dre D were making names for themselves as well. The hip hop culture had taken over the city. The hero of the city was on records and stores, and new talent was brewing. I began to host a uh, local video show called Sacktown Rap. Yes. It was a, you remember Sacktown Rap? Of course I do, man. DC Ray also had a TV show on the local public access channel, interviewing stars. Anyway, so she broke off and did her rock and roll show, and then I created Sacktown Raps. And so she connected me up with all the music companies down in Hollywood, you know, down in LA, and introduced me to them, like Def Jam, Motown Records, all the big ones, wow. and connected me up with those folks. Um, to get the, you know, music videos, because music videos was a big thing back then. Um, and then they would give me the DVD, the, the music, the DVD play, you know, back then it was CDs, I believe it was. Yeah. 
they they send a bunch of CDs out and a bunch of you know flag type of promo type material, and um, so anyway, I just started recruiting local, either rap artists or people that were in the music business in Sacramento, and trying to recruit you know somebody to um, be like. The uh, host of the show. Yeah. Because I was I was behind the camera. Oh, you were. You, do you mean behind the camera, like holding the camera, or you were just producing? Yeah, I was. No, I was behind the camera oh, and producing wow. and doing all the all the, all the editing. <laughs> wow. So I had, and I was doing all the graphics, and I had some friends of mine that were in the music business that um that did the theme song for Sacktown Rap to do the music for it. And then later on after it became Sacktown Rap, I started introducing some more R&B and jazz into the show, and I changed it to nothing but funk. While DC Ray and the new Sacramento MCs were exceeding expectations with their notoriety and their TV show, the next generation of rappers were chiseling their rap skills at the local high schools and street corners. This time, the young generation was mainly battling at Kennedy High School in South Sacramento, a.k.a. the K-House. As with the generation before it, this breed of rap battlers would engage after school, and the best from other schools would come to test their skills in the arena. Familiar names like Brother Lynch Hung, Sibo, Young Meek, Triple Six, Looney Colion, Miss Marvelous, First Degree to DE, BG, AK-47, Crucial Point and Bueno, and many more were freestyling their way into the Sacramento spotlight. Let me tell you something, um, Kennedy Burbank rap battles. <laughs> it turned out to a fight. You lucky if it don't turn out to a fight. But them, that's where all the great lyricists of Sacramento really put their work in at, uh, got motivated at going against other entertainers in the neighborhood, through different neighborhoods or whatever it was. But, it, man, Burbank and Kennedy, man, they used to be the spot, homie, straight up. Rap battles, terrorizing them guys. <laughs> you know what I mean? Brother Lynch. Uh, there were so many rappers back in the days that did not make it. I mean, a lot of good entertainers, man. They just, you know, was in the games, was in jail, all type of different shit came into their life. But uh, Kennedy, Burbank, rap battle, mm, mean, 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 boy, I'm telling you. The MC that rose to the top of the battle circuit was named it Ice Cold. You might hear about him a little later. Sacramento is the capital of California. It lies in Northern California, where the Sacramento and American rivers meet. As of 2016, according to the United States Census Bureau, Sacramento's somewhat diverse population of 495,000 was made up of 45% white, 15% black, 22% Asian, and 18 other with a significant Indian community. Around 1,700,000 people live in and around the city. Sacramento is 99 square miles. Sac is known for being close to everything. Snow, gambling, farming, and the Pacific Ocean. Although Sac can be considered spread out, the main neighborhoods contributing to the new underground rap movement was Meadowview, the Gordon Block, Foreign Road, Greenhaven, Oak Park, Del Paso Heights, and Freeport. Many of these areas are known worldwide. However, the Freeport legend only remains with the knowing. Yeah, AK-47, coming from Black Rage. For the 90s. I feel my mission can only be accomplished through one way, and that's to get ruthless. 
trying to say, cause I went black, I went soft, but I'ma let them know that I still can be righteous and be ruthless at the same time. The Freeport area became a serious rap proving ground in the late 80s. MCs from all over Sacramento would converge in the small Freeport area to become rap battle tested and check out the skills of other up and coming rappers from the area. Freeport was special because MCs from different areas used it as a safe place to battle. At the time, a young Adonis Sue Bone Williams had a spot in Freeport. It was a creative space. It was a battleground for MCs. At any given time, a handful of Sacramento sharpest MCs will be at the spot, including BG, AK the Teflon Don, K Japs, Riff Raff, and more. Giant tents of blends in the trees And creep on MCs like a midnight breeze Camouflaged in all black land in the park Fog will sneak into the town like dark Line up your soldiers, send for your best men Cause I'ma bust around like a gauge and blow your chest in Soup's Freeport spot Was one of the locations you went when you was ready to become a Sacramento MC Freeport pioneer Ace Mack, Ace of Spades at the time, was an innovative producer and influenced many Sacramento household names you know of today. Freeport groups like Black Rage, Ace AK the Teflon Don and Miss Marvelous, and The Wicked led the new generation of rap underground. The town had some special on the bubble. Their own sound, their own buzz, their own chip. And Freeport was a heart. Ace Mac taught me to make beats. First degree the DE exclaims. <laughs> you in a, for a special treat tonight. You in a special place right now and I'm excited for you. Sacramento rap documentary done brought you to one of the most golden hoods in America, the Freeport Hood. This arena right here, some of the hottest names came through to sharpen their skills. Hellraiser, aka BG, AK Riff Raff. This is when I first started hearing about Hollis and Emo production. Soup Bone, K Japs. Dude had a beard and a deep voice when he was nine. Tiny Tim, K-House Battler, Freeport Hood. The two groups that had run the Freeport Circle, one, Hellraiser and 9 Double M, that's BG and Marv Mitch. They, was, they had that chemistry and they were slicing and dicing. The number one group that was running the Freeport Hood though, was that Black Rage, which was AK-47, AKA the K uh, Teflon Don, Ace Mac, AKA Ace of Spades, who was like the center of the Freeport universe. It was all these alpha MCs, but in the middle, there was a soft-spoken controller of it all, just pulling the strings, making it all happen, Maurice Wheatley. That was Black Rage, and then they added a new member. When the word went out that they was getting a new member, was, folks was kind of curious, and then we found out it was, it was a female, folks was even more curious. That female's name was Miss Marvelous. Free, uh, Miss Marvelous was a product of the Freeport Hood, and they put out them Black Rage albums, Whew, them underground tapes. One more thing about Maurice Wheatley, Ace Mac, okay, Ace of Spades. Something important that I gotta mention. He was the center of it all. He was the type of person that used to take apart things and make other things with them. I remember he used to make G.I. Joe vehicles 
out of like hair dryers and he'd just take things apart and make it happen. They would go by themselves. But he was that type of person. He taught me how to play the keyboard. And he taught me how to do tracks. Ace Mac gave me my name, first degree. Which I got in the Freeport hood. I'm gonna do this because it's important. We're gonna keep this. It was summer. Ace Mac let me borrow that keyboard, the Freeport keyboard. It was a official keyboard, a Freeport that everybody used. He let me borrow it. And with that keyboard, first degree the D and the Rat Pack was born. And from there, it started to, you know, manifest into the, you know, DE, first degree the DE, where he started, you know, doing late night sessions at home and making beats and get with his other homies and uh, they would rap on the Ghetto Blaster with the mic, making these crazy ass raps. And I was just like, damn, you serious about this? I mean, it's like once he got touch or hold of it, he couldn't let go. And that's first degree to D. Man, 1993, man. This was the place right here. We used to go in here. There'd be a whole gang of us in there all day, every day. And all we'd be doing is throwing down, throwing down lyrics, coming up with Lord knows what. <laughs> we was green hanging. The Rat Pack Crew, MC King, Crucial Point, First Degree, T-Bone, J-Dub, and Rap Shot got their start on a borrowed Ace Mac keyboard, making the volumes at First Degree to D's parents' house. Hey man, you know, everybody had a story to tell and everybody wanted to rap. And it turns out everybody wanted to hear our story. Our folks put up with a lot with these homemade in-house studios for the sack rap history tip. I remember one time we'd get in there and uh, Degree's mom was getting hot because we was in there cussing up a storm. She kicked us out of the house. <laughs> This is what you really call putting stuff together on the spot. So first degree would rig up a beat, um, take about 30 to 45 minutes. He'd create a beat. And next minute, you know, throw the microphone down, he'd press record and we would just all go and spit our verses. None of the verses were planned out. None of the verses were written. None of the verses were even thought about prior to us showing up to first degree's house. But, you know, it was just most of us just having fun. And it was funny, too, because you had such different personalities coming into the room. Crucial Point was a consistent MC, clever with his words, feet always in the fire. Then you had T-Bone, who was the smart guy. You could probably say he was the intellectual, the nerdy one of the bunch, but he was actually cool. He wasn't like this bookworm, but he just knew stuff. And then we go to J-Dub. He was the comedian. I mean, he could just say anything. It would make you laugh. I mean, anything, even when he would freestyle, he would always just have some comedy in there that would just have us cracking up. Uh, then we get on to King. King was just cool. King was always well-dressed, just a smooth guy. It's pretty interesting. You know, something that would keep you uh, captivated. And then you had Debonair and he was like the ladies man back there. I remember he would just always be with some chick. And then you had First Degree who was the head of it all. And First Degree was always just what a... He was on a different planet. It is apt that he called his first album Planet Zero because literally we always thought that he was on a different planet. He definitely moved to the beat of his own drum, never has been a follower, definitely is out there. If you think out there, then you can go another 100 miles and that's where First Degree is. During this time, Kevin Ice Cold was taking his battle reputation to the studio. Rockin' lyrics galore, cause my brain will soar. I'll leave you chasing just in case in the place is a tour. I'm so smooth, I soothe, and I don't know who could write a lyric. So clear it remains a clue. My life's on reserve. Risen all curves, my mode is already loaded, so I can serve. All pray that's a vision to complete my job when I'm finished and diminished and be turned on mob. All the latest spectators who didn't arrive as soon as I point at the joint. The place gets live cause they knew I was coming I wouldn't be dumb 
soon as I touch the mic, all my boys are summoned Cause I rhyme like metal, so set up for the ghetto You try to buy my rhymes, my rhymes won't let oh PZ Pop is like you get close enough It's not a rhyme in Sacramento, just never let the lyrics flow The bon has got a job at uh, Geffen to, uh, to launch rap Because they were the only major label that was not doing rap at that time Vaughn said, hey, I got this demo, we want to sign them and it was Ice Cold, and the, I forgot what their name was before Funky Socialistics, but what we ended up doing was uh, Von Thomas said, hey, I, uh, I want to come down and, you know, see you guys perform. Came down, saw, you know, Ice Cold, Kevin, um, perform, and he was like, yeah, let's do it. So he sends like a 300-page contract. And it's like, hey, you know, while we're reading this, Kevin says, hey, you know, can you give me Vaughn's number? And he called him, he said, look, I don't want to do pop stuff. I don't want to be the next Fresh Prince. I want to do this, you know, very hardcore stuff that's never really been done before. Mm. Um, that Kevin was, do I think he's still doing. And um, Vaughn said, he called me up and said, I told you never to get my number <laughs> out to anybody. And that's not the direction we want to go. He goes, if they don't want to be pop, I mean, this is the first time Geffen has done rap. They don't want to experiment with, you know, cannibalistic, hardcore. <laughs> 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 you know, they want a Will Smith. They want pop. They want happy rap. And Kevin didn't want to do happy rap, and uh, which you know, yeah, I respect him for holding his ground. I mean, he had a record contract in his hand, and he said, "Look, if I can't be me, then I don't want to do it." Yeah. Um, you, you gotta, hey, you gotta respect that. At that time, I was young; I didn't really respect it. I'm like, get the money while you can, do what you want later. Um, and uh, so Vaughn said, "Hey, forget it. We have another group um, out here in LA, Seven Eight Three. They signed 783 by the end of the week. Dang. And we were completely done. 783 had a had a guy that produced their music. He was just a kid in high school, and he went by the name DJ Muggs. DJ Muggs. Uh, after one, one album with Geffen, they decided, Geffen decided this is not what we're going to do, and he left Geffen and started Cypress Hill. And the reason why Geffen decided not to do rap anymore is because they signed a tiny little group called Guns N' Roses. Oh! <laughs> 783, Kevin Ice Cold, Brother Lynch Hung, and Guns N' Roses. Oh! <laughs> they were all being signed the same time. Oh. <laughs> but you know what? I will say this, even though that was that was sharp to the ear. If Kev would have signed that, it probably wouldn't have been organic if he was doing something he didn't want to do, you know? It probably wouldn't have worked. The underground was hot, but DC Ray was still Sacramento's hottest rap commodity. In 1990, D.C. Ray was introduced to Cedric Singleton, a young strategist from Ohio who was equally hungry for the game. While playing basketball in college at Sac State, Ced Singh started a new record label with Robert Foster called Black Market Records. Their vision was to bring more of the streets into the Sacramento rap conversation. Well, you know, I came to Sacramento originally to uh, play basketball at Sac Sacramento State University. And um, so that's what originally brought me here to Sacramento. And I never left. And so I um, always wanted to be in, a, in the entertainment business. And so, you know, when I, I got an opportunity to manage a couple guys that I had met in San Francisco as rappers, 
you know, that's where my music business uh, career, and my music career actually started as a manager. With Black Market, our idea was to hit the ground running. We really wanted to make a quick impact on the market. So our plan was to uh, come out with the first single that was going to be directed more towards radio. At the same time Black Market Records was forming, DC Ray decided to go solo. DC Ray and Black Market Records came together and released Black Market's first single, DC Ray's What's the Matter with Your Life. By this time, life happened and the Triple Threat 3 went their own ways. However, DC Ray felt he was just getting started. The release of What's the Matter with Your Life kept the movement going. Eventually, earning DC Ray one of his three Sammy Awards. His Sammy Awards were limited to three because that was the max one could win. After the third, he earned the Sammy's Hall of Fame Award. The Sammy's, you are a three-time Sammy winner. The only time it's not more is the limit. How was that experiment? experience? That experience was a surprise because I really didn't know that my audience was as broad as it was. That was when I learned that I had a very broad audience. After I won the first Sammy, Sacramento started coming out for DC Ray shows. So I was getting put on venues that I wasn't normally getting put on. The third one hit, I was surprised. And then like you said, after you win three, you, you have to, they put you in the Hall of Fame after that. Sacramento's second biggest newspaper, the Sacramento News and Review, gives annual awards to musicians called the Sammys. The Sammys Awards celebrates all musical genres, awards outstanding Sacramento artists, and brings attention to local talent. According to their website, for 26 years now, SNNR has documented the local music scene as it has evolved and for the most part, grown. The artists listed are part of a proud Sacramento history. DC Ray, was the first rapper to win this award. The success of What's the Matter with Your Life dictated that an album be made. DC Ray, with said sing on the beats, started on DC Ray's debut album, The Prophecy. As with everything else, success comes with a price. Black Market and DC Ray's relationship eventually got complicated. One day, D.C. Ray was listening to 102.5 KSFM, Sacramento's main urban radio station. Suddenly, the DJ announced, Congratulations to D.C. Ray for being the first local artist signed to a major label. However, D.C. Ray was signed to Black Market and hadn't heard a thing about signing to a major label. Shocked. DC Ray called said Singh and said told him that the deal wasn't happening. It turns out the offer from the major label was from Joey Carvello of Atlantic Records. To this day, there's a few things DC Ray would like to hear said Singh say. During the recording of the Fahrenheit, DC Ray states that he'd like said to clean up the mess he made, admit some of his wrongs, and move forward. I could see he's trying to make everything right now, DC Ray defends, but I could have been signed with Atlantic Records. We could have done a better job with what's the matter with your life, DC Ray also realizes out loud. How would you like to bring closure to Black Market? Um, well, you know, we grown, man, and, you know, I've gotten over it, you know. Um, life goes and, and you take this journey you know you don't we, we can't unfortunately plan our journey we just we live it and you go through it and the decisions you make are the decisions you make 1990 northern california rap music was on the rise sacramento had its underground hip-hop king dc ray but who would be the prince by the early 1990s, 
Black Market Records was preparing a takeover. Cedric Singleton learned from his mistakes with DC Ray and was ready to move forward. Said wanted a new start, a chance to rebuild the brand. Uh, do the music and the first uh, official album that I was a part of, I produced uh, a guy from Oak Park here in Sacramento named Homicide. Yes. With his fresh start, said Singleton and Black Market Records signed and put out Oak Park's Josie Homicide Moore and his vision was official. So I'm ready to strike to the dog couch since it ain't popping up here, man. should have been done that, man. Let's do it. Hey, man, I'm about to run to the liquor store first. All right. You know, got to get my drink, y'all. I'm about to die. All right. Hey, Sam. You ready to drink? All right, man. Let's run. All right, let's go. All right, let's go. All right, let's go. All right, Homicide and the Jack Squad's knocking off weak MCs took Sacramento to a new place. The album was hardcore, bumping speakers with a sampled old school ice cube like sound. Sampling is when producers cut up and use old songs to make new ones, with tracks like Watch Your Back, Doghouse, and I Got a Warrant. Gone were the days of Sacramento dance rap. We entered the days of Sacramento gangster rap. For example, lyrics from Homicide's Young and Ruthless shocked Sacramento culture with its references to the city and the street life. It was a full rap album, repping and mentioning Sacramento. It was great, something that had never been done before. Make no mistake, Homicide was, was definitely on the gangster tip. He was with us through my phases uh, with What's the Matter With Your Life shows I put on. Homicide was right there with the family, and we considered Black Market a family at that time. Everybody, nobody had any any intentions of, uh, of doing, you know, we were all on the same page. Man, me and Homicide was cool, man. Uh, I remember running into Homicide in L.A. at a rap convention. I didn't even know that he was uh, signed to Ruthless Records. And I found out, I was like, damn, that's dope. You know what I mean? That uh, two kids coming up rapping against each other through the streets of Sacramento that made it. You know what I mean? I had Gas Chamber out, and he was over there working with one of the greats, Easy e for Ruthless Records. So, you know, congrats. You know, me and Homicide was always cool. It's a good dude, man. Shout out to Homicide, straight up. Homicide died 2020. Rest in peace, OG. Yeah, that boy, it's your nigga Young Mouth represent for Sacramento, Macramento, you dig? My nigga Sibo, how I feel about Sibo music in the 90s, nigga? Man, that nigga raised me, man. <laughs> you at my tree, boy, I'm telling Another piece of Golden Sack Town culture, the 29th Street Garden Block, and Mr. Doctor. More recently, the Stephon Clark killer. I used to tutor in them buildings right behind. And home of the infamous Sebo, the cowboy. See, I, I know Sebo before music. You know, um, my older brother, um, his brothers, you know, we all grew up together. Um, Bo is a, a, a lot older than me. Um, but the first encounter I remember having with him, uh, breakdance. <laughs> <laughs> My big bro had to remind me. He said, you remember when, you know, when, we, when we battled Sebo? I said, man, you got to be kidding. He said, man, you had to be eight. He, 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 he was, it was before he went to YA. Uh, I said, what? He said, yeah. Now, at the time, you don't understand who's going to become who, you know. Just shine, you know, of course, in the hood. Uh, yeah, they said, uh, battle Sebo and, um, he got the best of <laughs> When I was in middle school, uh, early high school, the gardens was talking about the cowboy. Hey, Meadowview, because of bro bro, was talking about Sebo the cowboy. 
You already know in Freeport was up on the Cowboys. <laughs> but when Greenhaven in the villa was all about that sea boat, the Cowboys was like, who is this dude? This is before I even heard his voice. Man, so salute to Sebo, man. Real pioneer from Sacramento, man. I think, like, the first niggas that I heard that was that was kicking that shit besides E-40 and Too Short was motherfucking Sebo and E-40. Sebo was Sebo before he was Sebo. Message to the youth. You want to be somebody? Be somebody. Then you be somebody. Come on. A local dude that was uh, that was well known in the neighborhood and throughout the neighborhoods and throughout the South Side and uh, before long, uh, you know, I mean, the whole world. It's around the time Sebo and Freddie T started calculating, and plotting and planning that AWOL come up. Well, me and that dude grew up together pretty much. You know what I mean? And uh, you know, I went down to Vallejo to uh, do some things and uh, come to find out that he was first cousins with E-40 in the click. And I had been rapping through Juvenile and coming up, so they was like, man, once they heard me rap, they was like, nigga, this nigga need to do a record. While the Black Market Records crew was building their foundation with Homicide and their new outlook, said Singh's crew continued to grow behind the scenes. A local drummer named Arthur Art B. Battle was helping with Black Market Records, setting up shows. Also, there was a young hustler in the wind, watching and learning. His name was Delvin Pipkins. It was Delvin Pipkins that walked Brother Lynch Hung and partner in Rhyme X Rated into the Black Market Records office. <laughs> you asked four people on how Lynch met said, you gonna get five different answers. What I'm understanding is Lynch met said at the Sacktown Raps party, but then Dalvin Pipkins walked him into the business office. While hosting that show, I actually met um, Brother Lynch and X-Rated at a party that, 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 they, that was going on, and we were actually there uh, interviewing, I think it was MC Breed that night. But I met Brother Lynch at that party. And I had a studio in my house, and he said that he wanted to come by and talk about an artist that he had, a friend of his, which turned out to be X-rated. Wow. So. In the late 1980s, on Ray X-rated Brown and Kevin Brother Lynch Hung Man, okay, and Maximilian Triple Six Bounty Coons had hit the scene. He showed up at my house, and uh, we. Uh, worked out uh, an understanding that, you know, we would do a record together. And the first record that we did would be the Psychoactive album. They had been inspired by the Sacramento Progress and sought to have their own say in the matter. They put out underground tapes, mostly story rapping to sampled beats. Mr. Policeman was one of those first records they put together and released on their own. By the time Dalvin Pipkins introduced them to said Singh and the Black Markets record crew, said had heard their talent and decided to go all in. Little did he know the crazy stories he'd be a part of. Little did he know the impact he and his new artists would have on our region in the world. By this time, Sacktown Rap Cruise with their own sound and serious heat was claiming territory. Bloods and Crip gangs were infiltrating Sacramento streets as well. Northern California rap had become the hottest underground rap hub in the world. Northern Cali rap pioneers E-40 and The Click, produced by Mike Mosley and Sam Bostic, 
have the nation appreciate the unique Northern California hip hop culture. Sacramento's new rap sound was harder than the norm, darker and reality based like Dubai's. Music producers like Funk Beta, Mike Mosley, Sam Bostic, Ace Mack, Brother Lynch, First Degree to D.E. and Hollis created the musical sound. It was a quality, rich sound that many had a part of. It was the sound that made Sacramento music special. Sacramento has its own style of music, own sound of music. We're more into lyrical raps. You know, uh, you want your verse to be the dopest verse on the record. It's always like a battle, a competition. You know what I mean? Uh, it was always street shit, you know, straight up gangster music, homie. That's Sacramento 90s rap. Sacramento rap is known for its grit and honesty and street portrayal. The Sacramento sound is, uh, I mean, it's gangster. It's independent, but at the same time, you know, uh, at different different aspects of the sound. You got, uh, you got the intellectual side of it. You got you got you got the conscious side of it. Uh, it can be international, but it's, it tend, it tends not to be that. It tends to be more of a grimy, real, independent. You can feel home type of cooking yeah. <laughs> sound. Money B from Digital Underground. And, you know, I've always been a fan of, you know, the hip hop that came out of Sacramento, you know, from Sebo, who's my homie. Um, I love Mozzie, rocking right now. Marvelous is the home girl. But I would have to say my favorite of all time would have to be Brother Lynch Hunt. Well, the, the producers was coming from the church. Yeah. The guys that was make, end up making the beats was all coming from the church. So at the you know, you had that flavor that was brought in where cats was really musicians. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And um like sampling and all that in certain areas. In our area, sampling was frowned upon. We had cats in there really playing music. Like, yes. And, and the producers, that was really the heavyweights could really play keys and things. <laughs> Nothing but respect to First Degree. He was on the album with me. Uh, and, you know, nothing but love to Sacramento, California, West Coast for life. You know, the Sacktown momentum at the time was more than just music. It's power, because the power of music is... The power of music. Mm. Music is an unseen energy in the human experience. It can be spiritual, it could be dance, no matter what type of music you listen to. It moves, it clarifies, it makes you feel better. Sometimes it can help you to get clarity in a situation or a moment in your life. Music can be used as an anthem to move millions. Power of music 
we use at parties to set the mood. Also, at funerals, the power of music is undeniable. I love music. Music is like therapeutic and it always triggers certain memories. I have a very eclectic uh, taste in music, so I like all kinds of different music. The power of music is a real entity, a real force, and most people who are in music knew they had this from a young age, all their lives. Most talented writers can write things that you're feeling that you didn't know you were feeling. Put together with a musical arrangement, it can come out to be the song that you always love, something that you always use in different moments in your life. The power of music to me is real. Cedric Singleton explains on a 2015 episode of the Fahrenheit Hour that although everyone ended up in different crews and on different labels, everyone felt connected. In the beginning, all of the pioneers participating in the Sacramento rap game were a family working together. After hearing X-rated Psychoactive, Cedric knew he had a hit on his hands. X-rated's lyrics were fast-paced and even more gangster than homicides. He was from the Gordon Block Crip gang and spoke it in his lyrics. His beats were produced by Brother Lynch Hung. Brother Lynch's unique producer trait was the complexity in his beats. He was sampling, often the same samples L.A. rappers were using, but he would use several samples for one song, making the track sound more like a hardcore collage. On Fahrenheit Radio's Fahrenheit Hour, said Singh remembers just finishing the X-rated album when I had heard about something that had happened about a mile and a half away from my house. It was the murder of Patricia Harris. In an interview with SacramentoRap.com, Funk Beta reflects on these crucial days of sack rap history. Right after it happened, X-Rated came to Lynch's spot where I was at the time. He told us they had shot someone. We didn't believe him. Mr. Singleton had a similar story about the days following the murder of Patricia Harris. Um, I'm watching TV and I see somebody had got killed not far from, from, from my house. Damn. And I didn't uh, know that there was a connection for X-Rated in this, but X-Rated uh, the next day came to my house and told me that he was going to have to go get out of town. Something had happened. I didn't have any idea of what it was. And um, so he, we, he signed a contract and he left town. And so I think it was two days later, I'm watching the TV again. And I see where they caught one of the killers of, of, of one of the of one of the, the killers in Phoenix on their way to the same place X Rated said that he was going. Damn. And I said I put two or two together. I said he said he was going to this place. Damn. I said no. Then about uh, I think a couple of days later he called me and said they caught me. I said where they catch you at? I said he said Phoenix, Arizona. Damn. I said that was you. And so. And that's, you know, and from there, you know, we started, um, uh, my relationship with X-Rated was kind of, you know, it was brief in the, in the time that he was free, but from there, our relationship grew a lot stronger. Apparently the story was the Garden Block Crips were in Meadowview looking for revenge. Earlier in the day, a Garden Block Crip member named J-Dog was killed. It was a whirlwind. And as a result, it turned out that the artist that said had just signed was arrested for murder. It wasn't the last time said Singh would be shocked by one of his artists. The media took off with it, connecting some of X's lyrics to the killings, summons Mr. Singleton. Although said owned the album, 
he still had reservations about putting it out. So I was kind of conflicted when I realized the magnitude of the things that had happened. Yeah. And so I, um, he said, you should go talk to uh, Patricia Harris's husband. He wants to talk to you. So I went to the house where she had got killed and I sat down and I talked to uh, Mr. Harris. And Mr. Harris told me, he told me, he said that you should put the music out. He said, because when he was younger, he was a part of the uh, Black Panther movement. And he said that the, 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 the freedom of speech, the right to the freedom of speech is too valuable of a right for me to say, you can't put this record out. And he said, you should put it out. He said, because what you're doing in this, in this community, as far as being a businessman, all those things, you are helping other guys see that they can do these types of things Damn. too. And so when he gave me his blessing, I had no, there's nothing that anyone else could say to me about whether or not I should put the record out. The sound of his voice had stress and experience in it. It was obvious that there was a lot of controversy he experienced with putting out the X-rated albums. However, getting the blessing from the victim's husband put his mind somewhat at peace. During this time, across the country in Florida, Luke Skywalker and the Two Live crew had released the Nasty As They Wanna Be album. Because of the shocking level of profanity and degrading of women, many took action against Two Live Crew. They were eventually taken to the Supreme Court over the lyrics. The case was watched around the country. The Two Live Crew won, bringing rap lyrics to the forefront of the country's consciousness. Two Live Crew went on trial in Fort Lauderdale, Florida on Tuesday, charged with singing obscene songs for paying adults during a nightclub performance last June. The jurors have an unusual request. They want to know if they're allowed to laugh. <laughs> and <laughs> Judge, that's the response that this performance... You know, I don't think they want to cackle or laugh the entire time, but apparently some of them are having some physical pain and... and <laughs> That I can understand. And I don't, I don't see a reason why they shouldn't react whichever way they feel like reacting. Your Honor, I, I'd like to go back from the beginning so they could laugh and we'd have the record reflect where they would have laughed had they known at the beginning they would have laughed. Yo, what's up? This your boy Uncle Luke for the big Sacramento documentary. Oh, man, it was absolutely beautiful. It felt great because I felt like I was fighting for hip-hop and we won. We won together. You know, even when a lot of hip hop artists wasn't support me at the time, but we still won. And people can do what they are doing on record right now today. With the two live crews case in the background, the court using X-rated rap lyrics got plenty of attention. Did his lyrics reveal his deadly plans? Tonight, authorities are looking into that possibility after a local rapper wrote a song about killing and now stands charged with murder. It all centers on the murder of a community activist and a rapper named X-Rated. Stan, two months ago, a gang of teenagers kicked in Patricia Harris's front door in the middle of the night. One of them shot and killed her. Carol, that community activist was Patricia Harris. She was shot and killed in her South Sacramento home two months ago, and police say a gang of teenagers kicked in her door and began firing shots. Now we are learning that one of those teenagers recorded a song about murder just two days before the killing gangs out of her Meadowview neighborhood. But police believe gangsters killed the 42-year-old mother and grandmother by accident when they stormed her house. Police arrested five teenagers for the murder. One of those arrested is a 17-year-old rap singer named X-Rated. To know and see that, that, that X-Rated is not really that rare. Said Singh owns the company producing X-Rated's record. It's a record that echoes the violence at the Harris home. One song is called The Murder. Part of it says, I'm knocking down doors, I'm killing mamas, daddies, nephews, I'm killing daughters, sons, and sparing you. The cover photo shows X-Rated holding a gun to his own head, taken weeks before the Harris murder. This gun is similar to the types used in the Harris shooting. I think the whole record itself is, uh, is an abomination. Joe Debs doesn't want the record out at all. He's with A-Gang, a guard against narcotics and gangs. When it comes to violence and when it comes to mayhem and when it comes to death and the destruction, I don't think we should be allowed to promote it. Sacramento County DA officials may subpoena the record company for the unreleased recording. I don't think it's right for the district attorney to try to use this record against him because all the evidence on this record and the album cover are circumstantial. Despite the eerie coincidence, Sed Singh feels people will benefit from this record. 
if we were going to deal with address some of the issues in society, some of the issues that led up to um, the, the L.A. riots, then we need to address issues as such, such as this. In an article with Workers.org about X-Rated, the author states, while shocking, Brown's case is not unique. It is emblematic of the many black underground and independent rappers that became casualties of the war on crime. Since the 1990s, California has led the trend in what professor of criminology Karis Kubrin of the University of California at Irvine has labeled rap trials. The article goes on to state that Andre Mac Dre Hicks and Sean C. Bo Carter had their lyrics used against them as well. In 1992, X-Rated was sent to prison. X-Rated has since said that he didn't testify about that night because of the street's code of silence. I could have testified and gone home, X-Rated has said since. He has also publicly revealed that he was present during the attack, but did not shoot the fatal shot that killed Patricia Harris. Because of the media attention on the trials, X-Rated was hot, garnering attention from around the country. Black Market Records continued to drop X-Rated albums from prison. And so, you know, X-Rated spent uh, four years in, um, in the Sacramento County Jail awaiting his trial. And so, you know, the first thing, and, you know, while he was there, he called me, you know, we, we were constantly talking. He said, said, we should do an album. We should do an album from here. And I said, how? I said, well, I got to thinking about it. I said, well, what, what I could do, so I started rigging my little studio up to record his vocals. And so what I did, I took the, you know, the old school phone where you had to screw the, the microphone on and the earpiece. So I rigged up my thing. <laughs> and so he was able to get two telephones. He could listen to the music that I played in one ear and he would rap into the other phone. So he would get everybody on the floor in the jail. Jail's normally a really noisy place, but they were quiet down so he could record the music. And so, and that was the making of Exorcist. All right, you are good to go. All right, with the gas on, he got for the Exorcist, uh, for the with a mask on. Let's get it. Two, three, four, yeah. My dope feet up, what it does, we in the building with the gas on, you know what I mean? 916 Sacramento Classics, Chia, block, 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 store. Alright, here we go to verse. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm on fire, I'm fire, but you niggas crash and burn like passengers on 9-11, you'll never find it, nigga burning at a high degree to me, find the reverend, I'm out of my mind, sick of tripping, and I'm gonna find a way to get into heaven, and it's not, and I'm slipping and clipping, and man, 11 and clap, 11, you rap rappers, so rapping as out of a lesson, great, I done had all the heads could take, very stupid than archaeologists, excavate me, the paleontologist, yes, and then you dinosaur, and your flow is outdated, and you doubt rated, ain't that a bitch, what you need to know about rated, my mouth rated at a level of I'm the greatest, that ever spit runs, and it's like a motherfucker, fucker with the automatic rifle, Outside of Sacramento's borders, X-Rated was a jailed hero. Free X-Rated, fans said. However, often the public only hears one side of a story. Within Sacramento's borders, it was a much different story. So, so there comes, there's a line. And I think um, some of these so-called rappers they step over the line. Simple. It was not so simple for Sacramento record stores. At least five stores said yes, they would sell X-Rated's record, lyrics and all. But some, like the tower chain, said no, out of respect for Patricia Harris. We're here what, in South Sacramento, and um, this woman did marvelous things, you know, I've read in the paper, and it's just, it's sad that a person like this can get away with things and, and maybe put out a record and try to promote it. And, and I just don't believe, you know, we, we should carry it at all. I'm still shooting mother as the war path never stops. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is causing a homicide. Your pop, if you're plotting on the jet. Punk, I see you coming from a mile away and light your ass up. So where does that leave X-Rated? 
for now behind bars, awaiting his murder trial. But his music plays on on the streets. I'm like the Terminator, loco, kicking down those with Brother Lynch, looking for yo ass. Blast everybody in the house, getting popped. Bullet wounds will get a nigga caught. They tell the cops that they shot you. You go see the doctor and they got you. Huh. A nigga like me leaves no evidence, sucker. When I'm jacking me a fool, I shoot the mother. To stop on a Ray Brown, I do anything. Cheryl Heard, News Channel 11. X rated was a controversial figure. Some love him because of his flow. Sacramento rap pioneering and hardcore reputation. Some hate him because of the woman he and his friends were convicted of killing. In 2018, after serving 26 years in prison, X-Rated was released. It was a day many thought would never come. Since his release, via social media, Andre Brown expresses remorse for the killing and communicates a desire to move on with his life now that he's served his time. Mr. Brown posts, The greatest shame I feel is for the senseless death of Mrs. Harris and the knowledge that I'm overwhelmingly responsible for her death, he wrote. It was my fault and I accept the responsibility that I owe a debt for her death. He also airs that he's looking forward to spending time with his family and teases new material by posting, I have a lot of new material coming. This is a huge blessing. I'm ready to get to work. His first single out of prison was California Dreamin', released by Blockstar Entertainment Records. X-Rated came home hot. In the beginning of the 90s, the city was torn. So Black Market Records made a move towards healing. Before you pull the trigger, think black. And ease up off the 
to the south side. Brothers and sisters are victimized by drive bang, bang. Another brother face down hard. And he's the bang and sack. How now they see. Nothing but the past blood stain on the curve. From a shotgun blast to the head. Another casualty. Life in the war zone. That ain't cool. Remember that 1991 Halloween bash Hollowed on the bass Was a smash No trash But on my way home The trigger went boom A single shot was all I heard I told my homie Y'all let's move to the T-Bird Just in case This ain't the place to be For the R-A-Y D to the C Then we again creeping But saw the yellow tape Stopped to park the T-Bird But then it was too late He looked to be in shock And almost comatose state Again random violence Claimed another victim's fate and Then I thought to myself What a tragedy To have to tell a story To them and with the family Man, put the weapons down My name is First D, and I'm here to strike. Keep dropping on the mud, and they go this way. Will I been on the shelf since 92? Man up, act like you knew. Let this record be a shot in the dark. I'm concerned about your life, I know your boy jerk. I'm in the first no champ, I like your back. Germany heard of me, act like you're on say. I hope this record make you wanna dance for minutes or so to escape your parlance. Never heard of Roxanne, Molly Mar, or J. Rue. Well, it's my job to bring it to you. You thought you would see, claim yourself as the best. Yet, be eat Trump in any contest. It's that top D, stop, yes, God, sit on rest. Came through the tilt, thinking you made it. Shot by the power sector, demonstrated. You ain't in Kansas no more. I pump jazz, can't hear a new rap. If they ain't helping the world, I can't hear that crap. This a war. Ain't no treaty. Southside SAC, I done told you that. Diggy's Revenge. Diggy's Revenge. Diggy's Revenge. Diggy's Revenge. My check one party jump when you play this record. Party party jump when you play this record. Party party jump when you play this record. Party jump when you play this record. When it comes to revolution, can't keep still. Trenched up with Ace, AK, and Doc Will. No, he didn't graduate with a PhD, but he goes on making meds for the DJ. You trip when I came with Zap and Roger. You call that rap? I call that breath of honor. It's something about your books. Make me sneeze. Damn, in the fake rap, give me allergies. I'm old school like Nick Peach King, Nicky. Smooth, quick, catch the good, and that's sticky. We wear khaki pants, not sparkling games. We looking like jeans, not planes. The party jump when you play this record. Play the whole DE album, don't skip your objective. DE's Revenge. DE's Revenge. DE's Revenge. Party jump when you play this record. 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 Being a hero makes me sexy. Or without Lexi, ain't too complex. Them saying I'm a riot, I'm not, no me, try it. When they want you quiet, don't try it. They call me racist cause I want you. 
you to think. If you matter, you matter. But I don't care what you think. I'm everywhere. From Portland to Norway. Doing my bus. What the fuck you know what? You striving for the best. Hell me too. Teamed up with an on music. And then beat it through. Shots out to Fat Joe. Who I got on the flex. DJ Urban Thesis. My brother is Rex. Zayn DJ on the concept. My beat with the cover. So I'm eating. Got some cool like no other. Just slap like on the beat and reflect it. Come to peace with yourself and find out what is next. I can't get the fuck song. They struck you with fits. Maybe kind of wonder who control your career. I see you sell a record, do them cool shows. Yeah, don't be your thing when the truth is false. You can soon rap, thinking you entitled. No, you have no control over the street recital. All right, peace, peace, folks. You a legend. Live on Toya and kids. And Jack is reverend. Got to my senses and you know this truth. Let a high you call tell. You can tell. OG, Gunny, Eddie, got your smile. Everybody knows it's me, the D-E-E, the double E. D-E's Revenge. D-E's Revenge. D-E's Revenge. D-E's Revenge. Hopefully, uh, people that aren't aware of the entire Sacramento movement will become aware and realize, you know, the heat y'all got up there. I'm on a quarantine right now, dealing with this bullshit. I've been locked down 25 days, you day. But, hey, I've been to jail. I know how to sit down. This is light work. Peace to sack. Respect.